Okay, so first things first is we are going to go into the client file to access the client's consent module. So as you can see at the top over here, we have a couple tabs and we can see consent right there. So normally, if a client has multiple consents, you would be able to use these search parameters to search for any consents, and you can use all of these parameters to narrow that search down. Uh, but I'm just going to go ahead and create a new consent file right here. So automatically, we have the start and end date pre-populating to today's date and a year from now. Uh, this period of time can be changed, um, which we will go over later on in this demonstration. So I'm just going to go ahead and add a program. And then we can move on to adding the consent method, the scope, and the reason. So all of these drop downs can be configured to fit your organization's needs. And again, we will be going through that later on in this demonstration. We can indicate whether a substitute decision maker is required. We can add any attachments that we need. And if our client revokes the consent, then we can give the reason uh, and any additional comments. Uh, but we'll go through this a little later. So here we can add the substitute decision maker or the circle of care. Uh, and we can also go here to find the consent form. So these consent forms are actually pulled from the case data form. So if this is already in your case data, then we can uh, use that in this consent module here too. So I'm just going to click on consent form and automatically we get the client name and the date of birth uh, that pre-populates. Here we can indicate who we want to share the uh, our information with. So I will do that. And this is where we can sort of turn around our computer, show our client uh, this consent form and get their signature. And we can add any details we want here as well. So once I save that, our consent for our consent light at the top here turns green, indicating that our consent is up to date. Now, if we were to change the date of when the consent is set to expire, so if we go and we say that it is going to expire by the end of March, it will turn yellow right here as the stoplight, and it means that the status um, change to review required uh, in nine days. Now, the individual that is assigned to this specific consent form will get a notification on their dashboard indicating that they have a consent that's up to up for review. Um, and this sort of time uh, during the expiry is determined by the organization. So again, um, I will have to show that to you later on in this demonstration. I just want to show a couple more things in this section here. So if a client were to revoke the consent, all you would have to do is just go here, give a reason. Again, this is configurable. You can give the revoked date. And the uh, if it's you know a reason that you need to specify, you can add that comment here or add any additional comments and you can deactivate this consent. Okay. So now I'm just going to go into the consent uh, in the global tab menu over here. And I'm just going to reset this. So here we have all of the consents and we can see the status right at the left here. So we can see revoked, expired, inactive, consent is up to date. So we can actually narrow down the search just using our search parameters. So if we want to see any expired or inactive consent forms of birth, or if we even want to check on the ones that are up to date, we can do so by going through consent status. We can search up by the custom form type, the consent scope, the revoked reason, expiry dates, uh, authentication, consent method, the consent reason, et cetera. So here we have the consent administration. And if you remember, I said that the, the dropdowns in the consent forms are configurable. So I can come here uh, and I can make certain uh, methods active or inactive, I can add new ones. Uh, and I'll show you what that looks like. So if I hit new at the top right here, I can add in a new consent method, I can give it a name in French, and I can give them descriptions as well. And we can either make it active or we can make it default. 
So that's sort of the same thing for consent scopes and reasons. And then we also have consent defaults. So over here, we have the days to expiry. So if you remember, when we initially made our, for, our consent form, uh, it pre-populated, the expiry date pre-populated to a year from today. That can be changed here. So if you need it to expire in a month, in two months, that can be done right through this. Uh, we also have the days to consent review, uh, and that's just when it's up for review. So we have it as a month, uh, and this is when the workers will start getting notified about a consent that they have to sort of review with the client. Uh, you can change this to however long you want this to be, but this is in days. And then we also have the revoked reasons, which looks very similar to the consent method scope and reasons as well. Okay, so now I'm just going to move on to appointment reminders. So if I go to my client, my client's file, and I want to turn appointment reminders on for my client, all I would have to do is go into their data set. scroll down to telehealth calls and appointments notifications. And I would either have to have an email for them or a cell phone. Um, and depending on which one you have, that is who that is the email or cell phone that will get the appointment reminder. Now we actually have three different options with the appointment reminder and you can use one or two or you can use all three. Uh, we have a, appointment reminders, which is essentially notifying the individual that an appointment is about to arrive. Um, so this can be set to however many days prior to the appointment you want it to be at. Um, so if it's seven days before or day before, you can sort of let the support team know about that and they will sort of do the configurations for you. Uh, we also have an appointment confirmation. So if a worker creates an appointment for a client who has appointment reminders, so they have either their email or their cell phone in this section over here, the evening of um, them sort of scheduling the appointment, the client will receive a notification just confirming uh, the appointment. And we also have follow-ups. So when an appointment is transferred into a contact, uh, the client will get a follow-up message and all three of these options, uh, we have. so the language in any of these messages is completely determined by the organization. So little bits and details that you want to add into that message is determined by the organization. So I'm just going to show you what it would, what you would have to do to ensure that your client gets the notification. So say that we're scheduling an appointment for Johnny, all I would have to go do is just add a new appointment. And I would just go ahead and fill it out as I usually do. But the one thing you need to ensure is that, oh, here it is. This is marked as present. So if it's this blank box or absent, they will not be getting a notification on either their email or their phone number. So you have to ensure that that's present. Okay. So I am going to move on to the client portal. So first I'm just going to show where you can access the client portal. So once I click on the client menu, I can scroll down, go all the way down there to client portal. And here we have the enabled checkbox, which indicates that the client portal is enabled for Johnny. We have the email, but if they didn't have an email and they just wanted to use a username, we could click this box and just give him a username. And we have certain permissions here that we can turn on and off for Johnny. So when we're creating a new client portal account, the way that it would work is that we would put in their username or email. And in this description box, there would be a temporary password that has writing in red. So this is prior to creating the client portal. Once we give them a temporary password um, and sort of give them an email and username and we hit save, that red writing will turn black indicating that a client portal account has been created and the client will get a little welcome message detailing the username, the temporary password and a link to the client portal. So I'm just going to move on to show you what it would look like when we have individuals, so for example, if Johnny's parents or 
professional workers, such as a social worker, wanted access uh, to Johnny's client portal, or they want their own client portal, apologies. So all you would have to do is just go in the client menu and go to the client address book. And this is where we would give, uh, this is where we would give Johnny's relatives or uh, professional workers an account to for a client portal. So here we have uh, Johnny's mother, father, uh, dentist, and family physician. So we can give any of these individuals a client portal account. But let's say that we wanted to create another client portal account for Johnny's uncle. So I will say this is for Uncle Cash. He is Johnny's uncle. And we can enter in certain contact and address information. But we can scroll down here to create a portal user for Johnny's uncle. So we're just going to enable it. Oh, and an important point that I have to make first is that we have to give permission to disclose Johnny's client information to Uncle Cash. So that has to be checked off or else it won't um, give access to the client portal. So we can give Uncle Cash a username and certain permissions. And then here we have our temporary password. Uh, over here at the top, we can also indicate uh, what start and end dates we want them to have. So this is usually the case for professional workers, like for example, social workers who are with the client for a certain period of time, and then it's just not needed for them to have a client portal later on. Uh, so we can put sort of start and end dates of when they have a client portal activated. Here we can again add some permissions. And so I also gave John uh, Johnny's uncle access to the client portal and I'm just gonna hit save. Okay. So it says that a username has already been. Okay. So once I hit save, it will send uh, Johnny Cash's uncle a welcome message, like I said before. So I'm just going to show how we can push information into the client portal. So here we have appointments. I'm just going to hit new here. And if we wanted to schedule an appointment for Johnny and we wanted to upload this onto his client portal, we would just go ahead and just create the appointment as we usually do. And even add a location. And here I'm going to indicate that we want to publish this into a portal. Uh, and I can make this accessible by anyone that has current access to Johnny's client portal. So I'm just going to put that on Johnny's client portal. But if I wanted his mother to see, I could also click that as well. And then I can also add a method and an activity list which pre-populates to 30 minutes. And over here, I can actually add a case note. Um, so for example, let's say I want Johnny to bring his journal. I can just type that over here and I can hit the checkbox. So if once you have the appointment with Johnny and you don't want him to see any of the case notes you make in this section, you could just simply uncheck the box when you're with him and then you can hit save and it won't show up on their client portal. But for the purposes of this demonstration, I'm just gonna click it so you can see what it looks like on the client portal side. So that's that. So once we save, it will update that on Johnny's client portal. And we'll go into what that looks like a little later on. I also wanted to show you how we can push case data forms into the client portal. So I'm just going to go to case data over here, hit new, and I'm going to hit the date and it's already pre-populated to today. And we can add an expiry date if we need. We can add a program, add any attachments, uh, and we can publish this into the client portal. And we can also make it editable in the client portal. So that means that if there's a form or assessment um, that we want Johnny to fill out, you just hit that. And again, these are all case data forms. So let's say that I wanted Johnny to complete the GAD7. 
This will show up in his client portal and give him access to the assessment so that he can fill it out at the comfort of his own home. I'm just going to save that. Now I'm going to go into the client portal. Okay. Okay, so now that we are here, um, I can just hit the username. I have read and accept the terms of use. And I can just add in his Okay, so here we came to Johnny's client portal, and this is what the client will see. And it's very similar to the worker's dashboard. So as you can see, we have a few appointments for him here, but we have this one that's scheduled on the 29th. This is the one I just currently made. And once it loads, we'll be able to see all the details. So here we have the date and time. We have who it's for. So this is really useful for those who are parents and they have multiple uh, clients within the organization. Same goes for social workers who work with multiple clients within the organization. We can indicate who it is for. Uh, we have the program, uh, the worker, the format, method, location, activity list, total duration. And here we have the little note that we left Johnny in the appointment section. So since Consents, MHQCY, OCAN, and eLibrary are add-on modules, I'm not really gonna get into that. Uh, so we'll go into forms first, and this is the GAD7 that I gave access to Johnny for. And here we have the assessment, so Johnny would be able to fill it out. And once he hits save, this will be published to the worker's account in real time. We also have attachments. So here we've shared a couple attachments with Johnny in the past, um, but if Johnny wanted to send something to us, what we could do is just go ahead, what he could do is just attach the file, give it a type name, an actual name of the file, reference date, indicate which program it's for, uh, indicate which worker it's for, and give a quick description. And at the top here, we also have contact info. So this is pulled from the data set. And this is a read only view because since it's pulled from the data set, we don't want the client to be able to change any of that information without the organization being notified. Uh, so if they did go through it and see that there were a couple of uh, mistakes, they could contact the organization and the organization can change it for them. And we also have account information over here. So if Johnny wanted to change his email, uh, default language, uh, or even set a new password. So once they're given a temporary password, they can come here to enter in their new password. They could do so here. Then we just have the logout button right over there. So yeah, that concludes the client portal demonstration.